Lombard Freed projects. That's her newest series, which is about, that's called Leviathan. Uh, Nina Yuen, who is actually an American artist who's going to be our next show, who um, I just discovered at the Reichs Academy through Tala Madani. And um, we uh, discovered her work, I'll say, because we, um, she has this beautiful video of her former boyfriend where she's making him do all kinds of things. So, um, as you can see, she's, you know, I'm sorry I stuck my toe in your mouth when you were sleeping. And that's her as... <laughs> Yeah, it's Frida. Um, I'll end with this image. Um, this is a show called The Girl Effect, which I put together last June, which was really based on, um, inspired by a new generation of young women artists who are working with social issues, but not necessarily from a post-feminist or feminist perspective. And it's uh, connected to um, Nike Foundation now, um, having put out these reports which say if you educate girls when they're seven in poor countries, they will then take 90% of their income and put it back into the community. And in this way, we will make progress. So um, this was the show. Yara El Sherbini, who's a young artist from London. Anna Pravachki, who did a bee project. Um, you could put bee, you know, the bees are disappearing. And she created a program where you can put away honey in safes and banks. An Israeli artist um, who did a piece of Pippi Longstockings trying to push over the wall in Ramallah. Okay, so um, save your questions. I'm sure you all have them, and let's hear Robin's um, presentation. I'll just run really quickly through a show that uh, I curated that just closed in January, and it, I thought it would be an interesting case study in terms of how you find artists, um, emerging versus established artists, and um, yeah, those kinds of questions about representation. So I'm going to really speed through it. But it was a show that, um, that I worked on in St. Louis, and it um, grew out of my work on the current series. And um, they decided to build a new building at the museum and to not really invest in any big exhibition projects. And so I left and took it to San Diego. So this. Either I did the show in San Diego, but it really is kind of a summary of, of the project series in St. Louis. Not every artist in the show was part of that, but many of them were. And it was a case of wanting to keep working with them and to work with them thematically. So I did the show about the influence of architecture on, on visual art. So one artist is Mikael Bormans, who's Belgian, and he shows at with David's Werner Gallery. And I got to know him and show him and a lot of other artists because when I was working on my dissertation, um, I was researching Gordon Mata Clark and David Werner had the estate. And so I was really hanging out there doing historical research. And then I got to know all of his artists. And so they've popped up <laughs> in a lot of exhibitions. So I'll just scroll through Boromans, brilliant painter, I think. I'd love to talk about this work, but I'm not going to. Okay, um, well, okay, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go more slowly. We don't have time. Uh, Matthew Buckingham was a Freud Fellow. Um, that's how I got to know him um, at Washington University. And he's, a, he's a brilliant artist who works um, kind of archaeologically and ethnographically. He'll go to a place, he'll do a residency, and then he'll make work in response to it. And this is a piece he did about Samuel Johnson writing the first English language dictionary kind of in his garret in London. Uh, Los Carpinteros, I mostly included them because they were in the collection in San Diego and I needed to have some local relevance to to the museum. I couldn't make it completely a St. Louis show in, in San Diego. So the, the, these drawings are in the museum's collection. Katerina von Edvelde is by far the most... Um, least well-known artist I've, I've ever shown. Um, she's Belgian, but she lives in Paris. And I ran across her work at um, one of the satellites of the, art, the Basel Art Fair in Miami. Um, she shows with uh, Amber Rall in Paris. And um, I just saw an animation on a, on a laptop, and I thought she was brilliant. Um, she, this doesn't do justice, but she, she makes wonderful collage drawings, and then she animates them into wonderful films. 
and um, she's only ever shown in this country with me as far as I know. Um, I, sh I showed a video of hers in St. Louis and then she made a suite of new drawings and two new animations that were in this show called Automatic Cities and I recommend her to you. She's, she's really smart and the work is wonderful and incredibly inexpensive. Jakob Kolding um, shows with team and um, I saw his work in Copenhagen and I was invited um, to do a kind of curatorial visit by the Danish Arts Council, which is, it's a great program, and I got to know a number of Danish artists. So you'll see, you'll see a lot of Zorna artists and a lot of Danish artists in my shows, just because of that's how I got to know them. Jakob is, um, although he's Danish, he's based in Berlin, like a lot of artists, he goes there because, uh, well, Berlin is kind of like New York for the Danes anyway, but in addition to that, um, there's cheap, big studio space. I, I asked my assistant to put one slide per artist, but they put the, she put the whole show in here, and that's why it's long. But um, and Lise Lagarde is another Danish video artist who's brilliant, and she, she has shown a fair amount, and she actually just had a traveling show, and she shows with Murray Guy, which is one of my favorite galleries. This piece I showed at the Pulitzer Foundation projected to the exterior of their Tarao Ando building, and that was a really beautiful nighttime presentation, and they had a Dan Flavin show inside, so it was this kind of relationship of different... Artists working with light as a medium. Julie Maritou is somebody that I showed in Currents. And then I, I, I showed her in a group show, and now I've shown her in another group show. And the last time I was at Smith, I was on a panel. Um, I think it was part of the same series that had to do with conservation and art. And, um, and I spoke about Julie's work. Wendy. Okay, I'll stop. I wish we had time to see this whole thing. I'm personally very interested in seeing the rest of it. Um, but I want to address, because we are a panel about sure. the business yeah, of yeah. art, a little bit of nuts and bolts um, to go back um, and ask um, Leah to just take an example of one of the artists that, you know, you can pick whichever one sure. of the group you showed us, and just <clears throat> um, talk to us about um, how long you've been working with that artist. Why don't you talk about Tala Madani sure, and sure. how you price the work. Has sure. the pricing gone up since sure. you've represented her? Like, really give us sure. nuts and bolts about um, the business aspect. Um, we don't have contracts with our artists, um, although I recently had a research contract because um, I'm kind of worried artists will leave me. I've had one artist leave me after I've actually put in quite a bit of time and money into them, so I have the opposite perspective. Um, Tala was a very curious case. We don't usually go to MFA programs um, to rape and pillage like what has been happening in the last 10 years. Um, but we did go up to Yale and uh, we did find Tala there in the studios. And, um, you know, there was, I have to say, I mean, discovering an artist, obviously you have your program, you have your ideas as a curator. There's a particular kind of, you know, focus. Um, I think, you know, obviously as an artist, you have a focus. Um, and so we have criteria in terms of what our instincts are and what we want to show. And when we sort of go, we, we stray from the path, you know, the collectors know it, the critics know it. Um, when we try to be too trendy or too markety. So we don't do that. Um, Tala, for some reason, um, was working in this kind of language of painting, which we actually don't show enough of. Um, it's very challenging us, for us to find artists who are working with painting in a sort of social um, way, uh, meaning sort of the work having some sort of level of political engagement in the work, and not necessarily didactic. Um, but Tala had it. I mean, she was coming from this Iranian-American context, also having studied with people like Deb Cass and, and Peter Halley. So, you know, the work was about American painting, about Kippenberger, about, um, you know, her issues, obviously, as a woman coming from her father still being in Iran, coming from that context. Um, and uh, we brought the work to the gallery, did not say representation, but sat with the work. Um, and, you know, the longer we sat with it in the gallery and began to sort of show people, the more we became convinced she was this extraordinary artist. And she, at the same time, I must say, was an ambitious artist. She was going for grants. She got into the Reichs. Um, she was pushing herself um, in terms of her own career. And we actually, we've, we've had great experiences and some bad experiences, mostly with bad boys, actually, not bad girls. But, um, you know, we want to work with artists who are going to be a part of a team in a relationship. 
And um, we know that right away when somebody's going to be a diva or just not secure enough about their work. Um, so how many years have you represented her? Since 2000, end of 2005. And, and how it, many shows it, has she had? Three. We just opened her third show. I would say from uh, now having the gallery for almost 15 years, it takes about five years, I think, for an emerging artist um, to hit a point in their career where the curators are beginning to see the work, the critics are writing about the work, the patrons are buying the work. Um, it really is a long process and um, that allows for maybe three shows or two and a half shows. You show an artist one and a half to two years um, out um, and uh, you know I think um, you know there's uh, I mean how do we know what to buy for our clothes? I mean that's such an interesting question in terms of like how you discover an artist. What are the prices of her paintings and have they gone up? Prices have gone up um, and you know we don't you know again what how you price the work Yes, when you're working with an installation artist or even photography, it's a very costly enterprise and production just go into that. But we, we really research a lot of what's, you know, what, I mean, at this point, we kind of know, you know, where an artist should be. Um, we try not to overprice the work of a young artist because we want it to go into collections. Um, certain artists want their prices very high, certain male artists coming from certain countries. And we try to make it sort of, you know, a reasonable amount. Um, I would say it's, it's you know, we, we've never priced work to add in discounts. We do give discounts all the time because there are patrons who do follow you or public institutions. Um, and so many galleries will actually add a 10 to 20 percent on top of a work. We try not to do that and we, we stick by, you know, our pricing. Um, but it's, it's very challenging and smart artists like Tala actually don't want their work to be priced too high. Her smaller works have gone from, I would say, about $4,000 to now ten in um, the last three years. The big paintings have gone from about eighteen to forty-four. Um, she's not a productive, she's not putting out generating work all the time. She has one other gallery now in London. Um, which was, you know, very, pursued her and us very aggressively. Um, and uh, we're considered her primary gallery, which is a difference. I mean, probably as artists, you know, it's good to have a gallery that you trust and respect and stick with in terms of getting you shows. But many artists, of course, have lots of galleries. Um, and many artists these days are representing themselves. I mean, if they can develop a studio practice where they can manage, you know, all the things that I think... Um, uh, the other, uh, I was impressed with the list of the, of the artists before in terms of all the things that go into, um, you know, the daily work. We, we, you know, that's our list as well. So, um, but Tala, it's it's a very, I mean, we're we're doing everything we can, and and primarily we're moving now as well to to please our artists to have a more public space, and of course it's going to cost us more. So, you know, the prices have to be. You know, the, I mean, you can't, at, at a certain point in your career, you can't be cheap either. You can increase your prices because the value of the work obviously goes up with your maturity, I think, to some degree. But I think a lot of artists who were hyped, young artists who went from university shows to galleries to $60,000 in the last five years, which has been pretty ridiculous, even for me. Um, I think are now experiencing, you know, uh, you know, a, a post. I mean, you know, a, a drop. That's, um, you know, I think, obviously a settling of of the market. But I'm sure quite shocking. I tell all my artists to buy real estate and to get jobs teaching or whatever they need to do. Um, you know, to keep at it. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's a very subjective profession and, and the market changes and shifts and, and you just hope as a dealer and um, and you deal with people. I would say I'm, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed that Roberta isn't here because, um, you know, I think, you know, it was interesting this morning because kind of the critics and the curators didn't get any, you know, <laughs> any, any um, criticism, but certainly, you know, Roberta writing a review, actually it's not so much these days, but, you know, she's a star maker um, to some degree, you know, everybody reads the Times and I have to deal with that as well.